You tear through your egg and something immediately bites your face. Your brother, he hatched seconds before you. His jaws clamp onto your head and won't let go. You thrash and rip a chunk of your own skin off to break free. The water explodes with movement, eggs bursting, bodies colliding. Everywhere you turn, your siblings are eating each other. The water is red. A sister charges you. You bite back on instinct. Your jaws split apart and lock onto her throat. She convulses. You can't let go, your teeth won't allow it. She's dying in your mouth and you're stuck holding her corpse when you see it rising from below. A six-inch fish with fangs longer than your entire body. An Inchotus, the saber-toothed herring. It looks like someone attached vampire fangs to a sardine. It grabs your sister's corpse and yanks her away. You go with her. Your teeth are still locked in her neck. You're dragged through the water, spinning helplessly as the Inchotus shakes its head, trying to tear flesh free. You can't let go. Your jaw won't allow it. Then the grip breaks. The Inchotus rips the corpse free and darts off into the chaos. You tumble downward alone, alive by accident. Once everything settles, you spot an adult Shifactinus in the distance, 20 feet long. Your father? Your mother? Doesn't matter. It's circling back toward the feeding frenzy. Adults eat their own babies. Your beaten up body is already screaming for food you can't catch. Most Shifactinus die in the first week, but what finally kills you won't be a predator. It'll be your own body eating itself while you watch, three days old. You haven't eaten anything. You're literally digesting yourself to stay alive. You finally spot prey. A two-inch fish hovering near the surface. You drift closer. Your body is so weak you can barely swim straight. Ten feet away. Five feet. You lunge and you bite empty water. The prey darted away before you could even get close. You're too slow. Your massive jaw makes your head heavy. You can't accelerate fast enough. You try again. Miss. Again. You're burning more calories hunting than you gain from eating. This is the curse. Your warm blood makes you fast in long chases, but your huge jaw makes you slow in ambushes. You're built wrong for both. On your seventh attempt, you finally connect. The fish thrashes for 30 seconds before it dies. You swallow it whole. Your jaw forces you to, can't bite pieces, 90 calories. You just burn 80 catching it. Poor you. Then you smell it. Blood in the water. Not yours. Not your praise. You turn and see an adult Syphactinus 15 feet away. It's not looking at you. It's looking at a school of fish between you and it. You're in the hunting ground of something that could swallow you whole. The adult charges, not at the school, at you. You're smaller, slower, easier. Its jaws split open and you see down its throat a tunnel of curved teeth and darkness. You dive. Your crushed tail screams in pain, but you force it to kick. The adult's teeth snap shut inches from your body. The pressure wave spins you sideways. You tumble into a forest of kelp and freeze. The adult's massive head pushes through the kelp, searching. Its eye passes three feet from you. You don't move, don't breathe. After two minutes, it leaves. You wait five more minutes to be sure. When you finally move, you realize you pissed yourself from fear. The ammonia smell will attract predators for hours. You need to swim far from here, but your body is too weak to swim far anywhere. Skip forward two months. You're three feet long and your body has become a prison. Your jaw has grown faster than the rest of you. When you open your mouth, your head splits so wide that your body tips forward from the weight and balance. You swim crooked. You're hunting in murky water when you feel it. The temperature is dropping. Fast. The current has shifted and cold water is flooding in from the deep ocean. Your warm-blooded body requires specific temperatures to function. Too cold and you can't swim. Too hot and you overheat and die. The cold hits like a wall. Your muscles seize. You sink. You're conscious but your body won't respond. Around you other fish are swimming away fine, their cold-blooded bodies don't care. But you? You're paralyzed, sinking toward the bottom where things wait in the dark. You hit mud. Something moves beside you. A flatfish, buried, watching with both eyes on one side of its head. It's fine. Comfortable. This is its home temperature. You can't even move your jaw. You lie there aware, thinking, trapped in your own body. If something attacks now, you can't defend yourself. If a scavenger decides you're dead, you can't prove otherwise. For 20 minutes, you lie there. The warmth slowly returns to your muscles. Feeling comes back in painful tingles. You can move your fins again. Your jaw muscles unlock. You rise from the mud and immediately get slammed from the side. A six-foot shark. It must have been watching you the whole time, waiting to see if you'd get up. Now it knows you're alive, and it wants to find out if you're weak enough to kill. It circles. You turn to face it. Your jaw splits open in threat display, but you're exhausted, frozen, starving. The shark can see it. It charges. You do something desperate. You charge back. Two predators on collision course. At the last second, you twist sideways and rake your hooked teeth across its gills. Not deep enough to kill. Just deep enough to make it bleed. The shark breaks off and retreats. It's not worth bleeding over a meal that fights back. You watch it swim away and realize your heart is beating so hard you can hear it. Your warm blood just saved you by letting you fight in cold water, but it also almost killed you by shutting down your muscles. You can't win. The thing that keeps you alive is the same thing trying to kill you. Skip forward one year. 
You're six feet long and you've learned to manage the curse. Hunt fast, eat quick, rest often. It's working. You're surviving. Then the water goes bad. It starts with dead fish floating to the surface, small ones at first, then bigger ones, then things you didn't know could die. Jellyfish, sea stars, everything. The oxygen is disappearing from the water. Invisible death. The seafloor plants are dying and rotting, using up all the oxygen. The water is suffocating everything in it. Your gills burn. You surface and gulp air through your lungs, but it's not enough. You need oxygenated water flowing through your gills and oxygenated air in your lungs. You're designed for both. When one fails, you only run at half capacity. Fish are dying around you. Their gills can't pull enough oxygen from the dead water, but you have lungs. You should survive this, except your warm blood. Your body needs three times more oxygen than theirs. Half capacity for you means suffocating just as fast as they are. You swim toward the surface, toward any water that might have oxygen. You're not alone. Hundreds of fish are doing the same thing, all crowding into the thin layer of surface water, all desperate, all competing for the same limited oxygen. That's when the predators arrive. They follow the dying fish up from the depths. Big predators, sharks, mosasaurs, adult syphactinus. They're suffocating too, but they have enough energy left to feed. A 12-foot shark rises beside you. Its gills are flaring, struggling, but it's hunting anyway. Dying creatures are easy meals. It spots you. You're too weak to run, too oxygen-starved to fight. The shark charges and you do the only thing you can. You open your jaws wide and face it. Your mouth splits into that horrifying threat display. The shark slows, calculating. Is this dying fish worth the energy to kill? A school of smaller fish swims between you. The shark turns and takes them instead. Easier prey. You survive by looking more dangerous than you feel. But you're still suffocating, still burning energy you don't have. The oxygen crash is killing everything and you're just dying slower than most. Skip forward three years. You're 12 feet long. You survived the oxygen crash. Survive the cold snaps, survive the adult hunters. Your body is covered in scars, but you're alive. Then you meet her. Another Sipfactinus, 13 feet long, female. She's in breeding condition, her body chemistry is flooding the water. Every male in 30 miles can smell it. You're not the only one who found her. Five other males are here, all around your size, all competing. The largest male charges you immediately. His jaws split open and his hooked teeth aim for your face. You dodge left. Another male hits you from the right. His teeth rake across your side, opening red lines. This isn't mating. This is war. The female is circling, watching, waiting to see who survives. She'll mate with the winner. If you want to reproduce, you have to fight five other predators while she judges. The big male charges again. You meet him head on. Your jaws lock onto each other's faces. Neither can let go hook teeth don't allow it. You're locked together, thrashing, trying to overpower each other while your teeth tear deeper into each other's flesh. A third male slams into both of you. The impact breaks the lock. You tumble away, bleeding from your face. Two males are fighting now. A third is trying to approach the female. She ignores him. You're exhausted, bleeding from four places. You've been fighting for 20 minutes, and you haven't even gotten close to her. The big male just killed one of the competitors. His body is sinking with his throat torn open. You make a choice. You leave, swimming away from the female, from the fighting, from any chance of reproducing. You're too injured, too tired. If you stay, you'll die for a maybe chance at mating. The female doesn't even look at you as you go. You're not worthy. You failed. You spend the next two weeks alone, healing. Your injuries attracting every scavenger and opportunistic predator in the area. Twice you almost get killed by things that smell your blood. Your face scarring makes your jaw mechanic slightly off. It doesn't split evenly anymore. Hunting is harder now. You survive the mating battle by running away. But you'll never reproduce. Your genes die with you. 20 years of survival. For nothing. Skip forward two years. You're 14 feet long. Old for ship factiness. Your body is breaking down, muscles weakening. Bones aching. Reactions slower. But you're still hunting because your warm blood demands it. Your body eats itself if you don't feed it constantly. You haven't eaten in six days. Longest fast of your life. Your body has consumed most of your muscle mass. Your ribs are showing. You're swimming crooked because you don't have the strength to balance your massive jaw anymore. Then you see it. A fish. Eight feet long. Fatty. Perfect. Maybe the last meal you'll ever need. Your brain is screaming warnings. Too big. You're too weak. Don't. But you're starving. Your body's digesting your heart muscle. You're dying anyway. You charge. The fish sees you coming, but you're faster, one final burst of speed from your warm blood. Your jaws split wide, your hooked teeth sink into its back. Deep, you taste blood. You start swallowing. The fish thrashes. Your teeth hold. Your throat stretches. The fish is going down head first. This is it. This is the meal that saves you. Except the fish is fighting back. Its spiny dorsal fin is scraping the inside of your throat. You feel something tear. Internal damage. You keep swallowing. Can't stop now. Your hooked teeth won't let you spit it out. The fish is halfway in your throat when you feel it. You can't breathe. Your gills are flaring, but nothing's flowing. The fish is too thick. It's blocking your throat completely. 
You can't get water through your gills and you can't get air through your lungs. You're suffocating with eight feet of prey stuck in your jaws. You thrash, trying to force it down or rip it out. Neither works. Your hooked teeth are locked in. The fish is wedged solid. Your body is screaming for oxygen it can't get. Then you smell them. Sharks. Blood in the water, your blood from your torn throat. The prey's blood from your teeth. They're coming. You're choking on prey you can't swallow, can't release, bleeding internally, and sharks are circling. Your jaw split wide enough to take down prey half your size. Now that same jaw is locked open, trapping you in a bite you can't escape while your body suffocates itself. The sharks arrive while you're still thrashing. Three of them. They circle once, twice. They can see you're dying. Just have to wait. Your vision goes dark at the edges. Not from night, from oxygen loss. The fish is still wedged in your jaws, still blocking your throat. Your hooked teeth are still locked in its flesh. You sink toward the bottom. The sharks follow. Patient, professional. This is how they hunt, let the ocean kill prey, then eat the corpse. Your body hits mud. Soft, quiet. The fish is still stuck in your mouth. You're still aware. Thinking. Knowing you're dying. Knowing your own jaw did this. The last thing you feel is a shark's teeth closing around your tail. You're too weak to care. 87 million years later. George Sternberg will find you in Kansas Stone, your jaws frozen open, the eight-foot fish perfectly preserved inside your throat. He'll call it fish within a fish and put you in a museum. Millions of people will see you and think, incredible hunter. None of them will see the truth written in your frozen jaws. You didn't die hunting. You died because your body demanded more food than you could safely eat, built you with a jaw that couldn't let go, gave you warm blood that burned through calories faster than you could replace them, made you slow and clumsy with that massive head, shut down your muscles in cold water, suffocated you in oxygen crashes, forced you to fight wars for mating rights you'd never win, and trapped you with hook teeth that locked you onto the meal that killed you. Life is Zephactinus, 20 years of your body being your own worst enemy. And believe it or not, there's an animal with an even worse life. Watch that story next.